select board. First item is public comment. This is comments on anything that we do not currently have on the agenda. I just have a quick, uh, Tamara Morgan, I'm from East Randolph and representing Kimball Public Library. I just wanted to, should I just pass these around for you guys? Sure. Um, there's just little posters about the summer reading programs and summer programs we've got. Um, mostly to help maintain continuity um, of education and mirror the folks in the community and give the kids, you know, there's a jewelry making class. I think there's there's recently been a robotics. Um, uh, one of them is a Vermont Reads. We're going to read a graphic novel by John Lewis about his life. Um, he's a congressman and um, did a lot of civil rights activism in the 50s, 60s, 70s still. <laughs> um, and we've also got uh, Star Wars Stormtrooper Day, mm -hmm. and we've also got a, um, one of them you'll see there that we especially wanted to point out is Drag Queen Story Hour, which we wanted to assure you if you get calls, there are certain people who are targeting this event, which um, is happening in Montpelier, is happening, it happens around the country, um, and there are certain anti-gay activists who target this event. If you guys get calls, if the, you know, Joyce has to get a call, I can probably call her. Um, just tell them to call the library. We've got it handled, and Amy will send it to one of the trustees, and we have a plan for responding. So, so what is the event, is Isaac creating the It's Drag Queen Story Hour. So mm -hmm. it's a couple of drag queens get doing story hour, kind of like. Like we did when we did the meeting people that were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like With the yeah. Department yeah. Preview. Yeah. yeah, and it's in the, it's in the same um, mm -hmm. time frame as the Chandler um, Pride Week events. Mm -hmm. um, it's all kind of within a whole scope of programming, so. They have whole programs you can go watch those folks where they talk about their lives and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, but we do know that there's, I can't remember her name, but there's a particular group um, with a name in the front of it that, that um, is calling and is kind of making a bit of trouble for... So that's seven days. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably about the Montpelier yep. um, place. So we just wanted to let you know and assure you that you can just send any calls to us. And also just wanted any to let you know what's... Just good. Good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just trying. Well, you can try. <laughs> We might do our best to answer, so maybe you don't want that. <laughs> and if you want to see stormtroopers, there's another group coming. Where's one? We want to do these. And then there's the puppy reading, where someone brings their dog and kids read to the dog. The air bus was out there today. Yeah, they're doing drumming inside. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments? Is approval of the agenda? I may ask the board to consider two possible changes. Uh, one is uh, including the tax stabilization agreement with the Greenmount Economic Development Corporation, which the board had previously discussed uh, to old business. And also, if the board would be inclined to reorganize the new business category. We have a representative of a uh, community group that would like to form the Art and Culture Committee in the audience and uh, if they could be reorganized so that they could go in maybe the fifth position or they wouldn't wait around for the rest of the meeting. So potentially uh, the letter D from I to D. <coughs>
minutes from June 13th, the public hearing of June 18th, and the current. Okay. Thank you. Maybe approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. New business R3 child care program proposal. Are you speaking I, on that? Yep, I can speak on that. Hello, everyone. I'm Amy and Gary Cola. I'm a co chair of an, uh, R3 Downtown Economic Development Task Force and also heading up a second task force that arose out of that process related to bringing more high quality child care to Randolph. Uh, the last select board meeting we uh, submitted a uh, what I believe to be a pretty detailed proposal to the group with supporting exhibits uh, uh, with our request to have 45 South Main Street, the former senior eye care building, uh, uh, committed from the town or to our group to um, pursue a child care, high quality child care center at that site. Um, uh, the proposal we submitted, and hopefully you've all seen, received both paper and electronic copies of that, goes into a number of details of our reasoning behind it, our support, our background. So I'm going to give just a brief overview tonight and then open up for questions that you may have about the proposal. Um, in short, one of the things that came out of our R3 task force is the need in our town to um, pursue attracting the human capital that we need to for our town to survive, businesses in our town to thrive, and our, to increase our tax base. Uh, one of the things that our task force identified as being a key challenge to Randolph is the lack of uh, child care centers. Uh, the only available birth to five full day child care center in Randolph right now is the Robin's Nest at uh, run by Gifford that's only available for Gifford employees. It's full and can't even meet, meet the demands for Gifford. Uh, pretty much every business that we've talked to in town has expressed, uh, including the town itself, has uh, noted that they've lost or been unable to recruit uh, individuals to town because of the lack of child care. Um, the challenge, of course, is uh, with the new child care regulations, which uh, um, the state is in passing in order to promote high quality child care centers. It's also increased the cost and uh, the challenges of making successful business out of it. Uh, our group has spent a lot of time looking at different ways to do that. Um, we believe that if we can make a, at least a building available um, from the town at, for free or no cost, it will um, give us the highest likelihood of being able to recruit somebody to run the center and also create a business plan that will actually be successful and sustainable um, for child care in the future. So our proposal is, uh, in fact, Adolfo had originally mentioned that the Singer Child Care Center building was available. It seems to be uh, approximately the right size and the right amount of man land that would uh, prove successful to convert into the child care center with some work. Um, so if we can start with that building, um, put together a nonprofit or a fiduciary to start producing producing grants and raising money to convert it into a center. We can also develop a program for, uh, I mean, a process for recruiting somebody to run the center. Um, the reason we're asking for the commitment now from the town to make the center available is we've gotten to the point where we need to raise money and start developing a plan for soon grants. Um, if our entire plan centers itself and hinges on having a building available at no, little to no cost, um, we can't pursue those steps unless we have a commitment from the town to make the building available um, and take it off the, the market to give us a chance to develop that. So that's the, the gist of our proposal. Of course, we have uh, much more details if you get a chance or if you have had a chance to read our proposal, including the background support for uh, the child care numbers uh, in our town and throughout the state. Um, if, if you have questions, i uh, open it up to the select board members. What happens to your proposal if there isn't, if it isn't just handed over by the town, the building isn't just handed over? I mean, the building was purchased, we did sort of some of these details, and it was purchased using general fund dollars. The intent was that it would go into the police district to be the potential new station for the police district when it was purchased. 
and then there was a whole bunch of moving pieces, and we got to sort some of those out to figure out where all that's at. But the taxpayers of the town have invested this money in the building with the intent that it would become a police station. And I think we got to sort out how, what, you know, to make. I don't know that we can make a commitment tonight that we can just hand the building over for little or nothing, but we can. I think we can make the commitment of you know whether we take it off the market or and work with the group to develop it. I'm just, what does that do to your business model if we can't make that commitment that we can just the the degree that we can't work out the details of what the relationship is going to look like for the town, it makes it uh, that much more difficult to develop the plan that we're going to market to somebody to develop the site. Um, you know, by um, Sometime before, as we get along, if we're writing a grant or if we're pursuing somebody to run, we have to say, here's what the general model might look like and here's what the costs are going to be. And then the biggest challenge is with developing this center has been cost, this particularly, you know, the mortgage releasing costs of a building. Uh, and if we don't know what that's going to be, it makes it very difficult to create a model that will work to recruit somebody to run it or to figure out what that's going to look like, and that's especially when we start to have to pursue grants, one of the questions is going to be what's, what's the model, what are the costs going to be, and a lot of that centered around the building. So if we can't get to the point where we at least have some general degree of knowledge of what it's going to be to start, it makes it very difficult to put together a strong proposal for a grant or a strong um, uh, perspective, so to speak, looking for somebody to potentially take over and run the business. Uh, again, if we had to start with the commitment to take it off the mar market and work with it, we can certainly, um, that's, where we, that's where we need to start, that's where we need to start, but it's just going to extend the process because it's some time before we pursue the next steps, especially um, taking money from people in terms of either um, donations or grant money. We need to to know what it's going to look like. Yeah, experience with grants. I mean, mm -hmm. the sitting there and they've had it too. Is that they commit to capital things much easier than they do operating the operating side of things. So I just I keep that in mind that the mm -hmm. the actual cost of the building may not be out of the question when you're looking at grant funding. But, uh, but the, it's it's the business model actually. It's, I mean, we need a, an overall structure to work. The challenge is that everybody's been looking to both the existing folks who are out there, and um, there's been a number of folks who are pursuing how to either develop or sell, like Montessori in town, to uh, it, attract people to run these centers. And the challenge is, is when you have the mortgage costs and everything else, you can't find the business model. Right. There's grants no. out there for which you wouldn't have a mortgage that yeah. will pay the cost of that building, will pay the cost of rehab, the cost of putting a fence around the playground, equipment, well, those type of things. We can't pursue the, the rehab and the structure of what it's going to look like until we have somebody who is committed to running the place and knows what, how to make those designs and structures. It's, uh, you have this, uh, you know, what comes chicken and egg kind of issue here where, uh, it's tough that you can't commit to grants or money from people to develop the building to make it look like something before you know who's going to run it and what the structure and design is going to be for the actual business behind it. Is it going to be zero to five? Is it going to uh, commit to toddlers? And until we know what the business model is going to be, um, that becomes a big challenge. Uh, we're a volunteer group. None of us are the child care providers who are going to be running the business. You know, we are now is to attract those person, those people to, to run the business and develop the business model behind it. Um, so it's a challenge for us to go in and say, oh, we're going to, as non-child care building experts, and not the people who are going to run the building, to say we're going to remodel this building and create the design and then find somebody to run it. If, if you understand the, the point that I'm I understand what you're saying. I understand. I don't know that. Just going into it with a model of the town donating the building is all the right mindset either when a lot of your grants are capital focused and would reimburse for the purchase price of that building. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. is all I'm saying. Just keep that yeah. in mind because some of your grants that are out there will go, they go towards assets and mm -hmm. capital versus, there's not many, very few for operating. And, and I mean, the grants costs. would be focused on the cost of developing, the you know, renovating the building, um, creating an outdoor play space, all of those things. So we're not asking the town to commit the capital to make those renovations. Uh, Although we would be asking the town to help pursue to the extent municipal grants are available to do that to help with the process. Um, if you understand the, the distinction I'm getting out there. <coughs> I do, I'm just saying don't close your eyes to covering yeah. all and of it. And again, it's a, a flexible process. If we find, it, once we get into it, that suddenly we have a grant that will cover the purchase price of the, the building, we would love to be able to then purchase the building from the town eventually and have it be owned by the person who's running the center. Um, our ultimate goal would be, and, and as we laid out the structure to start with a no-cost lease with the idea of developing the grants and the business models, and if money comes in, the opportunity for that building to be self-sustainable and for the business owner who's running the center to purchase it from the town, that would be our ultimate goal. Uh, it's just be tough. We can't get to that point until we have a commitment to start pursuing the business models and see what's available. And for that, we need at least some commitment from the town to make it available at least for some time at little to no cost. Has there been a conversation with other providers in town? Um, there has been. Our group involves uh, um, other people who are involved in the child care process. Carmen, who's been running the Montessori process. I mean, the only other provider in town, Robin's Nest and Gifford, is part of it, and they're actually supporting our process. They're, um, willing to provide kind of their expertise in how to run the center. They provided their the plans for their center to use as a support. Um, so we've talked to as many people out there as we can in terms of how to make it work. Uh, and that's why we've gotten to the point where we're saying the next step, what we need is we need to start getting money to assess the building in terms of what renovations are possible, what's, what you can do with the building, uh, um, to start pursuing food to run it. And, in order to take that next step, we need the commitment from the town to make the building available because we're not, it's tough for us to spend the time and money pursuing those things if at any moment the building could be sold or the town could say, well, gee, we're happy that you went about doing this, but we're going to do something else with the building. So, what was an engineering study of that building done when we first got mm -hmm. it for the police? Mm -hmm. so before they would look into the design of that, it might be. It'd save you some money and time if you had that. So it'll tell you where the structural <coughs> yep. pieces are, where the challenges were. And it, it was part well, of when we even looked at that land for the fire station. Yeah. Um, there was some other work done in the general area of it. And I think we know the, the initial contractors who did it, we did have the folks, those folks come out and do an initial kind of just general view of the site for free. They were willing to come out and kind of look at it just to kind of give their general impression of Yes, there's no immediate red flags, but in order to do more again. Oh, no, this one's looking at what it would, like ele elevators, yeah. with building support elevators. This was much more mm -hmm. the engineering of the building itself. Yeah. So the, and That's that would be so. definitely something very important to have. One of the big issues we have is uh, plumbing and what we can do with plumbing, too, if mm -hmm. we need to adjust for additional bathrooms, other things. So again, Just look at putting that... Uh, addition on so they could pull in and they wouldn't have to we wouldn't the general public wouldn't see who was in the car well that's part of the fun you have to want to hide that from us and i, and I think we <laughs> get factor. i think we get a lot of this stuff done that we need to do at little to no cost and getting people to either volunteer or, or provide low-cost services at least for the initial assessments for um, a, a lot of the initial construction cost uh, it's just it's tough to hit. I can't continue to ask people to do that without knowing that we sure. are going to actually yeah, use the building. <clears throat> so we spent about six months pursuing kind of the generals behind it. We're just at the stage where we need to know whether this is possible or not. Yeah. Get, given the realities of the, the financial you know, aspects of childcare, um, is, it, is it at all realistic to think that the town will be really getting you know, money for this building at some point in the future, um, and what kind of time scale will we be looking at to get the town's investment back? 
Um, it's, to, to be honest, it's, it's hard to say. There's a, the new legislation that just passed this fall creates a lot of additional financial incentives. Um, it's, and ways to bring in reimbursements for different levels of childcare. Uh, it's tough to see, say, how well those are going to really play out in terms of a business model over the next year or two. Um, it's, it's a challenging business right now, as mm -hmm. we're seeing. That's why we're exactly. getting a decrease, especially the new high-quality legislation. I mean, the legislation to promote high-quality child care has driven a lot of people out of business because it's increased the cost of being able to do it. Which, uh, um, so I, it's something that we're, we would hope that we could get to that point, but whether I could commit to it or say that there's a timeline, it's uh, we, we can't do that until we yeah. Start yeah, really well, looking at business plans and running the numbers, which we can't do until we know what the building's going to look like, what the initial costs are going to be, and start getting somebody involved who's really interested in running it. Because this, this is my fear. You know, we we have this building and it's empty, and so it's very tempting to, for all of us to say, well, what do we do with this asset you know, to make it productive? And this is a really high good use of such a structure. And it's an obvious need for the community, and I think there's no, but he thinks that's, that's mm -hmm. not true. Um, however, you know, the, one of the reasons why the, the building has been sitting is because you know, we're probably asking too much money for it. Um, and we're just waiting for the right buyer to come around. <coughs> um, if the price for the building was lower, we would sell it, right? It just depends on how low we were willing to sell the building for. I think we're asking for 25 for it. Um, you know, let's let's say the building would actually. And I'm just making up a number here, so you know, this is just hypothetical. But let's say we that the building would sell right now for two hundred thousand dollars. That's two hundred thousand dollars that we would have that we don't have right now. And um, and basically, you know, if we you make this into a child care center, then we've we we don't have that option anymore of getting that money for that building. And from a financial point of view, it's the same situation as if someone were to come to the town and say, can we have $200,000 to open up a child care center? Will the town fund that for us? I suspect that we would probably be pretty reluctant to do that um, if someone were to do it. It just feels really different because we actually have the structure and we yeah, have a mortgage on that yeah. structure. I, I would make we it. We have a mortgage on it, so mm -hmm. what they're asking us to do is for the town to continue paying the mortgage insurance, all the costs that we have mm -hmm. to make this happen. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, just, I just want us to make sure that we're looking at it from all the angles and we're not just thinking, it. you know, what's going to be, you know, what are we going to do with this empty building? Well, and if you're publicly subsidizing that one, are there people that are in it that are on a smaller scale that are going to be like, hey, where's my help? Mm -hmm. I don't a, know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. I, I make two points in response. Uh, one, uh, that the difference is you have a building that's only incurring costs for the town right now without benefits. Um, and so you're having an opportunity to take something that at least is just a cost drain right now and turn it into a public benefit. Two, um, everything that we're looking at, and, uh, uh, yeah, and I it would take me an hour presentation to go into all the details tonight, which is why I put it all in the report with all the exhibits behind it, showing that this is a problem that the town cannot afford not to solve. Um, the economic benefits of creating the center are much higher than the $200,000 benefits from just selling the building in the long run. If you can bring in um, additional child kill, which brings in additional residents who are living in town, which potentially increases the tax base or at least it increases the ability of businesses to be able to hire the people they need to either sustain themselves or expand. Um, the problem we have right now is if businesses are um, doing well, but they're con continually hitting a roadblock where they cannot <coughs> hire the people that they need to either expand or even sustain some of the level of businesses that we've had. We did a survey of over 26 businesses and repeatedly this issue is coming up and the problem of child care has been one of the top problems of recruitment that they have is a problem that's not getting better, it's getting worse. There are less anybody disagrees with you that yeah. child care is needed or what the benefits are if it's available. 
it's the how do we move into this with our eyes wide open mm -hmm. of what we're doing with an asset that the town's having to make payments on. Yeah. And so what we need to make sure is that we're looking at everything and we've made the decision that this is the highest and best use for this asset and these town resources. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. You know, so <coughs> And now what we need to do is get our head around what the entire picture is mm -hmm. and what the options are to make that mm -hmm. decision. And it's hard when you're when you're in a catch-22 on your side, mm -hmm. too. So a lot of the questions that we'd like to have the answers to going into this, you can't give us the answer to them because you don't have what you need <coughs> to get that answer. And, and I think one point that I can raise to address this is we're not looking for a permanent commitment if we start looking into these answers and we can't come up with a viable business solution for it and we can't bring in somebody to view the property or commit to it, then the town the town still owns the building, the building is still there for the, the town to sell it. Uh, we're not looking for a indefinite commitment to make this work, but uh, we need enough of a commitment so our group can pursue what we need to do to get to the point where we can answer some more of these questions. Uh, so what is the time frame for that for developing that business plan I mean, I mean if we said hey we could take it off the market for six uh, six months and <coughs> incur those taxes you know and, and payments for six months and you come back with a business plan then we can assess what that means to the town at that point I'm, are we talking a year or 18 I months? think realistically we need at least a year uh, given how long we're you know Carmen was presuming somebody to um, potentially take over her Montessori business is, uh, for, which is an existing child care center in town um, for over a year, a lot of her options, which in, that was already developed, uh, um, a lot of things that she were pursuing uh, drug out for six to nine months to almost a year where they were just working on the possibilities before they fell through. Um, we're starting from a point that's a little bit behind that because first we need the building assessment um, and then we need the architectural assessments and then we need developing the grants we need to reach out to local businesses because I think part of this is going to have to ha have support from local businesses in order to make it work. It's not going to be a, a, a standalone structure from what we're looking, looking at. Uh, and that's going to take some time to develop um, and six from months. From a subsidy perspective you know, from I, businesses or just business investing in the child care? I think or either it, it could come in different ways. I think we're going to get need to have the businesses who are directly in, impacted by the lack of child care for their employees to provide support either in terms of subsidization for their own employees who are attending the center or uh, a degree of subsidization communally from a group of businesses for the center itself. Um, if I look at the Robin's Nest model, my understanding is that it survives at the level and quality it does because Gifford is backing it up. Um, there's, and that's a big challenge throughout the state that people are running into when I talk to the folks at Let's Go Kids. If you're a big enough organization, you have enough employees, you can <coughs> sub potentially subsidize the center. Um, and, but then you have a bunch of collections of small businesses that individually can't do it. So my uh, hope is that we can get a collection of businesses together who are all impacted by this uh, program to all contribute to um, building the center. I'm not saying that that's necessarily going to be the model that eventually works, but um, my initial impression at this point is that's going to, if we can make something like that work, that's going to give us the, the greatest chance of possible success of getting uh, sustainable business be together that will eventually be self-sustaining, or at least would be sustaining outside of the town. Why don't we make a suggestion to the board for you to consider if, if the board would be inclined to potentially have a six month period where Damien and his group could, could, could go back and do some more work, um, maybe revisit the issue in January just before the town meeting uh, warning is due uh, and or approved and then at that point if Damien comes back to the select board and says, you know what, we, we did all this work, it's not going to work, you know, we can put it back on the market. Or the report from Damien is in the R3 group is, We've, we've done some more work, a lot of studies, lots of success. We found a whole lot of money, and then we could potentially work with the board at that point and put a question on the town meeting ballot to bring it to the voters and maybe have them consider it. So it would be understanding that Damien and his group may need a year's worth to 
to potentially have a final final recommendation of the board or a final plan. But if we did in six month six, six month increments, there could be another report to the board, and the board can then make another decision in January. Great to see that. Here's the progress we've made, but we need a more time. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. It could be a six-month commitment to take it off the market, which would give your group some time to do some more work with the understanding that in January there would be a second report. And, yeah, and we're happy to report back in any way that makes sense. I would just say that we need enough concreteness about what is possible from the town that we can you know, pursue the things that we need to pursue in terms of talking to businesses about their potential support, uh, um, talking to potential stakeholders and you know, also most importantly recruiting somebody who is going to commit to turning this into a business model and, um, and actually running the center which is the biggest challenge out there even right now with the, the existing child care centers they're currently losing directors so over and over again it's a very hard uh, business to sustain with the qualified people especially with the certified teaching that they need in order to meet the state requirements because then they tend to go into the education system, the public education system as soon as they have an opportunity. So we need to be able to make our best presentation possible in order to recruit a high quality person who's going to take this on as a business model. That's going to be tough to do if I don't have enough of a commitment that I can assure them that if you take this challenge on and get involved with us because I need to get that person involved to know what the plans are going to look like because it needs to be their plan, not my plan, with how the building should look. Um, you know, I, I can't do that to some level if there's still uh, not enough security out there that it's going to be pulled out from under them assuming that it's a viable plan. So, again, I'm not saying not to do the six-month report back. I'm just making it important that we have enough concreteness in the way that we're setting it up that we can make pitches to people that uh, I can make with honesty and straightforwardness and be able to sell this to businesses and <coughs> business owners. Okay. I can see a couple things happening. So I'm with the belt though. Okay, I think that six months might give you the time yeah. to at least come back and say, okay, we're making progress and moving forward. I could see options of potentially, yeah, if there was money available to purchase it, great. If there's yeah. not, then maybe there's a way to structure a lease that went on for a period of time so that that still gives you the option to be able to move it forward. I don't know what that lease would look like. I don't know what the, what the payment schedule or anything like that would look like. It certainly takes a lot of, a lot of creativity to come up with this stuff, but there's numerous kinds of leases that could happen. <clears throat> I'm curious, Josh, do you know much about any of the grant funding that might be coming forward? Have you heard of anything that helps these kind of situations? Well, there's, there's an opportunity coming up next week for municipal buildings. I don't think we're going to be able to make that deadline. Probably make that deadline. Um, but uh, there's also opportunities in the fall um, that would be long term, like a planning grant. Okay. So that might be useful in this situation for sure. Yeah. And there are a lot of grants out there. Um, it, you know, the, the challenge is again getting the the business model together so we can know what it's going to look like, so we know what we're doing with the grants. <coughs> and that's the part of it that becomes a real challenge if we can't say what the leasing structure is going to look like, or what you know, if there's going to be a mortgage payment, if there's not going to be a mortgage payment, at least to start out with. Um, which is why I think it's important that we. And, you know, eventually get to the point, and sooner rather than later, that we at least have a commitment to start with at a no-cost introductory period for the business, so that we know what we're starting with, so we can make the pitch for somebody to come in and figure out what the business model is going to be. I mean, we can't develop a business model if we don't know if it's going to be a X amount of dollar mm -hmm. per month lease or uh, mortgage payments, or if we're covering insurance or taxes uh, or if the town is I mean we just we need to work those things out so we can get to the point where we can have the conversations we need to do this for which is why we wanted to get to the select board sooner rather than later so we can make sure that we're starting to work those things out uh, what are our <coughs> with carrying comps? Uh, we have an annual payment 
I don't recall the exact amount, but it's roughly fifteen thousand dollars per year. It's roughly about a thousand dollars, a little over a thousand dollars per month. Uh, we also have some heating oil costs, uh, which I don't have off the top of my head. We have to heat the building because of the angle of the water pipes. We won't, we would never be sure that we get all the water out. So rather than freeze the pipes, we have to heat the building. So the heating costs. Uh, and the insurance sure as well. Yeah. And they don't break that up, like, really, yeah. as far as I'm capturing that. Yeah. We're probably in the 20, 25,000 range at the most. Yeah. What if we did it through town meeting, which would give them options or some other options of doing some sort of article? That would be what, eight months? I think that's what Perry was suggesting. Yeah, and I think think on that same page. Is, you know, this gets them up to January. At that point, we can get a report back from you folks what you've gathered. You know, at that point, put an article out there and say, okay. Yeah. You know, I know when we talked about this prior to you being on the board. You know, we were all pretty much in agreement that we felt this was a, a pretty good use of the property and, and a substantial need for the community. Mm -hmm. So I think we felt that we had a general consensus at that time that this would be a good way to move forward for the need that is existing to foster the economic development piece of this. So, you know, I think if we could do six, seven months, you know, you guys get back to us, at that point that might give us an opportunity, you might give Karen or this planning grant, mm -hmm. then I think, you know, we'd have a little bit more information mm -hmm. to make decisions about, and then, as I said, I, I think, yeah, you could put an article out there and see what happens. And I think you find that there's overwhelming community support for this based on what I've seen from the R3 stuff. Just uh, so that the, the board knows that the reason I chose January is because the warrant is due in January, late January. So it would be, uh, to your point, it would be available for the town meeting uh, vote. And what's, what's the size of the mortgage you have in the building? Uh, the total, the initial purchase price was 275 The sale price was set at 325 because of the amount of money that went into the investigative work. Um, most of the payments that we made are interest only, so we typically would have the entire outstanding balance. The, the capital is still so at roughly two seventy five. Two seventy five. Yeah. It's maybe more if our interest payments initially were uh, less than interest only. It was just what the bank was willing to accept. So we may have added some of the interest costs onto the capital. So it may, it may have increased. What we're paying. What we'd be giving up shows a fairly large commitment on the town's part mm -hmm. when they're looking for funding. Yeah. Well, in kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, exactly. it's in like an in-kind or matching grant piece, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of, you know, if there's, a, if there's a match to a grant, you know, what the town kicks in certainly would look pretty substantial, I would think. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. It's structured all different ways. Yeah, there's lots of ways to structure this. Yeah. Structure it so there's no payments on the capital for certain number of years and then you start making payments for there's yeah. Yeah. grant funding yeah. for assets that you may have to be up and running to get or whatever, but that's kind of the information you need. I hate to walk away from getting the town reimbursed for that building if it's a matter of somebody writing a grant for them mm -hmm. to be able to buy it. Yeah. I mean, an easy way to structure it is if those grants avail or become available to the business person who's running it, that uh, they have an obligation to, to apply yeah, for them and run into it. I mean, those things are easy to, to solve. I mean, our, our key challenge is, you know, we need the person who's going to be the, bus the business person running the place, the work group of volunteers who aren't child care people who are willing to put in the time and energy to make it happen, but we need, again, a commitment commitment from the town to put in some energy to it too, because we're, again, most of us don't see direct benefit from it other than the need from the town. Uh, so, so are there different ways to structure this, one being, you know, as a for-profit situation or a non-profit similar to what I referred to back down in Lebanon? Mm -hmm. There was a, Twin Rivers, I believe, was a, was a model that I looked at down there that was a non-profit. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the structure you guys are thinking? Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of different structures that could potentially work. It depends on who we're going to serve. I mean, our goal is to be able to serve as many of the residents as possible. You know, our idea would be to make it affordable mm -hmm. to everybody across the town. Sliding scale type needed, situation. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, again, we need to 
recruit the person to do it, and it all depends on how what our overhead is, yeah. and we don't know what we can't know what our overhead like, is. Chicken and the egg. No. You don't want to be a profit if you're going to No, no, it, yeah. no. I'm sure of that. I'm just you saying it's just like that's profit. what the truck structure is. Is how does that happen? So yeah, and it's my uh, our thought right now is that the most successful structure is going to be to start with either non-profit or fiduciary to start pursuing the grants, but also then to once we know what at least the, the general overhead is while we're recruiting the person to run it, also start recruiting businesses who have the need, who need child care for their employees and their recruitings to see what levels of commitment we can get for those businesses um, into the building of the structure. But that will determine the level of services, whether it's educationally yeah. oriented to what level? Yeah, and part of it again, the person we were recruit. I mean, it's who we're able to recruit to run this business and doing the model on what level of business they're looking at. I mean, if the only person we can find is only interested in doing a uh, zero to toddler age group to start with, that still feeds, fill, fills a need that we need to do and uh, is not what we're not going to pass it up. So we have right. our, our idea of what we're going for, but we just need to get enough concreteness so that we can make a pitch to, to find somebody who's going to do it. And we do that unless we know we're going to be able to run with this building and, if, and what level of overhead we, at, you know, at an ideal level we might be able to start with, with the course option and again an ideal situation is to be able to get to the point where we can own the building at whatever uh, level makes sense. And I'm like saying we, it's not our group, it's whoever is. Never part of that nonprofit situation. Right. When you're running the numbers, though, for now, you know that your worst case scenario is the purchase price of the building, right? Your best case scenario uh, well, is Well, we wouldn't be going forward with this building, yeah. and we wouldn't be going forward with this building without the commitment to at least start with the, the low cost. I mean, if we're dealing with a, unless we have that as a model, this isn't a viable option. I think we spent six months looking at this and being able to recruit somebody just for where we're at to buy a building and purchase it, it's, oh, it's going to be tough. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Um, that's uh, the reason Carmen couldn't sell her business. Uh, the cost of the mortgage is prohibitive of anybody, even with the, they're not willing to pursue the grants and other things. They're just not enough to, too much overhead and too much work to get started. But again, we've uh, I have to say, we spent a lot of time looking at possibilities, and this, this seems to be our our only reliable option of getting a center together anytime soon. Uh, so, keeping track of the clock and all the other folks that have items on yeah. the agenda, does it give you what you need if the board gives you that six month period with a report back? And it, uh, I guess the one thing that I'm unclear of is what the six month period for the report back is to take off the market, but what, in addition to that, is there any commitment to a structure? Is there anything that I can tell somebody who I'm then recruiting to that's saying, you know, if we report back with a viable model, then we're going to, and the only thing that works is a no cost or a low cost lease that we're going to have commitment from the town to do that. I guess that's the only part that I'm struggling it with. I'm not going to pass, I'm not going to pass up like anything you gave me. Six month, you know, um, report back is not really helpful for you without some sort of a commitment because you really need to go back to somebody and say we have we have something that to work with to take the next steps that, yeah. and if you don't have that you can't proceed it's it's tough to continue to ask my the group of volunteers to proceed beyond what we because we've had those conversations we, we've identified grants that are out there um, but again I'm not going to pass up what we can get but I'm saying to really be able to do what we need to do in the next steps. We need some level of commitment that the town is willing to um, give us a low cost lease or a low cost option if that's the most viable, if that's the only way to get this started um, to move forward. Um, so, so I think you guys made a really good, you know, page one through five case for the need for child care. The date is there, you know, the interviews, et cetera. My challenge is, and I, and I agree with the child care need, my challenge is, is that you know, you're asking the town to commit this kind of, you know, um, make this commitment for a potential of 275K, which isn't happening and sold for quite a while. But, you know, the, to me, item on page six and seven, A through F, the, the current plan of action is just super high level. 
And if we were to say, hey, we're going to take it off the market for six months and we're going to commit to a, a, a low-cost lease or no-cost lease, I don't want to see some sort of milestone schedule that says this is going to be done by here, here, and here, so that measurement is real as we go along. Okay. The six-month thing of, yeah, we're just taking a potential 275 and throwing it away for those six months a little, is yeah. a little bit concerning. And remember, you're not throwing away the 200 and the jugs. So you still own the building. By but if somebody came tomorrow, we piece. took it off the market, we say we're going to take it off the market, and there's no, you know, six months from now, we, we're kind of at the same place, or it's still unknown. <clears throat> The challenge is we can't get to those milestones without being able to recruit the person. Who's That's all, I, and I'm fine. I'm, yeah. I'm personally, I'm fine with saying six months, and we commit to a to a no cost, low cost, whatever that may be. But I would hope that you'd come back next month and say, okay, here's our plan of action over the next six months to get those things done. Mm -hmm. So we hold to that commitment because otherwise, you know, I never put in a proposal for any of my work without having a capture plan that tells my management, my 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 stakeholders, you know, this is a good investment. We should really go after it because this is a return. This is a plan. This is how you're going to measure our progress against that proposal or, or, or uh, quote whatever it is. That's that's all I'm yep. concerned about. Is six months is a, you know quite a long time, but not having any information or a measurable milestones along yeah. that way. Well, yeah, but it's also not a long time. <laughs> yes, you've got one. That's we had good. one. Yeah. Um, you've got one that was coming back. He had to get, I don't remember what happened, it was an issue, and he bought, the, he bought another building in Middlebury and was coming back in five years. And that's got to be getting pretty close. It was so <laughs> I, I get that I haven't yeah. sold Damon. I, I, I know, really and, and what I'm saying is it's, it seems like it's a long time, I guess, from select for standpoint, but for a group of volunteers where you're right. getting a, you know, people with volunteers who aren't the business owners, who don't have a stake of this, who are just trying to do it for the benefit of the town. That's, it takes a long time to well, make any progress. I get it. All I want to know is what's, forward. what are the milestones that get you to the six months? That's all I'm asking for. You know, when is B and uh, uh, C and D and E and F going to be done? Mm -hmm. Right. What are the projections? It's okay to miss them, but yeah. you know, some measurable thing that says, okay, you come back in October and say, hey, we've we accomplished not only two things we thought we would, but the four things. We're ahead of schedule now. It's awesome. You know, yeah. we have no way of knowing what me what the measure of success is here. Yeah. So you're saying in terms of you know by you know our next minutes develops the plan of action for uh, recruiting the the person to run the place, uh, identifying X, Y, and Z grants. I mean, yeah. that's, that's easy enough to do. That's but, all I'm asking yeah. is what yeah. is the plan. Yeah. And what are the goal? What are the goal lines to get there? You know, to that measure that success. <coughs> so when somebody comes from a sick community, says, "Hey, you know, you know, what are they doing with this?" Well, this is what they're doing. These are the measures, and then we really know that you guys made great progress in these six months, and it makes a whole lot of sense. So to me, that would be measurable enough to commit to uh, you know low low cost or no cost type. Yep, and that's easy for us to come back. And, you know, once we know the parameters that we're working with, sure. that we can start pursuing the loans, figuring out who. Which we've already started looking at, but again, we're just hit the stalemate where sure. it's saying. Well, so, if you need to come back and you know, give us a commitment now, but also with our commitment to come back in October and say, here, here are what we're doing and what we've been doing and what we're doing over the next six months, that's easy enough for us to do. And I will just say, you know, it sounds like the town could easily find itself in a position where we are continuously. You know, funding this organization in terms of keeping the building open for them at no cost. Um, I don't. I don't think if this ever got started and was you know, providing good services, I don't see us saying, "Oh, sorry, we're going to close this down now because we're not getting the money we thought we were going to get one day." Um, and it could turn out to be an indefinite contribution from the town. Um, I'm not saying that that's something that we shouldn't consider, but I'm saying that we should make sure that's what we realize that we might be getting ourselves into, and that. If we're talking about fifteen or twenty thousand or twenty-five thousand dollars a year indefinitely into the future, that that's a subsidy that we're willing to to, to take on for for this. That's somewhere that there needs to be more numbers, in my opinion, to to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> yeah, but they it's need making the, the commitment yeah. that we'll take it off the market for six months, and that we'll we'll enter into negotiations for a low cost, no cost lease. But what that looks like, you're, you can't commit to, to that piece. You know, somewhere you've got utilities, you've got maintenance and repair on the building, you've got a lot of different items that still would need to be hashed out 
and that's all going to play into your business plan. Yeah. Because if we say, here's a no-cost, low-cost lease, but power, heat, all that's yours, and any maintenance the building needs to keep it in at least its existing condition, you're, you're looking at more than utilities to put into your budget. You're looking at... Well, but what do I have to do for building maintenance on this structure? And that's why I need so to part know, of the know, study. know the parameters, yep, in order to... You know, and I think it's, if we said, you know, under the right conditions we would do that, you're going to be like, well, what are those conditions? And we're going to be like, well, we don't know, because what do you want to do? Where do you want to be? <laughs> so, you know, we're just, we can sit here and chase each other around all yep. night. We're not getting anywhere. We've been at this mm -hmm. almost an hour. I think you can comfortably go forward and say, I have some stuff, some homework to do to get a schedule. That they're giving us six months to come back and say, what have you made for progress? And if it is a situation that makes sense, you're willing to entertain a no-cost, low-cost arrangement. But we don't know what that means. I can't say we'll commit to $500 a month and we'll do all this, these type of activities and you'll have these activities. You know, there's there's still a lot of variables even when you say we'll enter into that. Type I of agree, which is exactly why we're here because we need to start okay. the progress of figuring out how we work out those variables in a way that doesn't, you know, have us well, losing a lot of, you know, But it's got to be fair to the, the taxpayers too. You you know, all town government here. doesn't run child care usually. Mm -hmm. So you're, we're looking at getting into an area that we all agree is needed, but how do we do that so it's fair to the taxpayers? Mm -hmm. You know, and Larry's point is a good one. Are we ready as a board to say we'll absorb a cost of twenty thousand dollars a year to subsidize this child care facility? What happens when the next one comes in? You know, there's a lot of policy things well, here too that we gotta look at. And then we would have uh, hopefully have a model built so we would know what it would look like before the But next they would say, Well, in. where's our yeah. building? And I, you know, I, I guess I would say there it depends one. on we would know whether it was working or not at that point. We might, but then we might be able to say, hey, this makes sense to do with five more buildings. Right. Uh, um, or you know, it didn't work. The challenge we have, this isn't working anywhere in the state right now and over the place, so we're trying to come up with a new model that um, hopefully will work that's going to take, given taking the town, it's going to take some risk on the part of the town and a lot of risk and time on our part who's willing to pursue it. So we just need to give the town the town to be able to give us enough of a commitment um, given the magnitude of the issue for our, you know, the town be further Do you feel like you have that now? Um, to go on? If the commitment, let me just be clear, that if the commitment is six months with the commitment to pursue a, a potential low cost option, again, considering that everything that we gather up makes sense, uh, um, as long as we have that well, a memorandum of understanding or letter of intent to engage in those negotiations in good faith and, to and that the low cost option or no cost option is on the table, um, I can work with that. Uh, it's just making sure that that is clearly on the table if we come up with, you know, somebody who would run the place and uh, a plan that looks like that it works. Uh, Does anybody have any problems with that? No, I think no, I would, I just get a try this. this. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I don't know, I just think that it's, as much as we need this, that it's, it's, it's probably not the, the town's responsibility to providing child care and, and that we can help get something started, but I think that we need some, to know that going in that there's some sort of exit strategy for the town, that it's not going to cost us a quarter of a million dollars to get this done. Or that we're going to have five more to support down the road. <laughs> Well, and I would say I, I think part of my proposal is the commitment to have an extra exit strategy. Again, if you have a viable plan, I think at some time, you know, the town, if that doesn't work out, we'll have to decide, you know, weigh those interests, which I, I put in here as well, and I agree with uh, the town's got to decide what is, you know, the benefits of the child care center um, stronger than the benefits of, you know, the money that they potentially might be costing to help support it on some level. And that probably mm -hmm. depends on which taxpayer you talk to. Yeah. Yeah. If, so, you, if you came to the town, if we didn't have this building, you came to the town and said, well, there's this empty building here, we need the town to sign off on a loan for $275,000 yeah, right. and pay for all of it, pay for it, then definitely mm -hmm. until we kind of figure it out, I mean, it would be a kind of a hard sell, but you know, the difference is that we actually just yeah. have to build it. And, we're not maybe, maybe, we bought it. Yeah. We're set, sitting on I, it. I, I understand. It's going nowhere. I understand. I just, I just want to 
I just want to try and give it the perspective that I think it deserves. Yep, no, I, I agree with your perspective 100%. And I, uh, but we have the building and we're trying to present a, a use for it that we think uh, makes a lot of sense and will bring more economic rewards to the town. Yeah. No, I, in and the I get that too. And there may be grant opportunities to help take it off our hands. And then, you know, we've done this with other projects in the community. So, you know, we sign on grant applications all the time for different things around here. So, in my mind, this is the next big need, and maybe we'll be the model community that makes it happen, and other communities might be able to follow the model. So, so Josh, you said there's stuff coming with this follow up. There's, is there stuff that, of this magnitude of dollars for yeah. the grand size that would be able planning, to? This would fit in with the grand. It's the planning side of it, though. Yeah. Implementation. Looking at the building, what does it need? Again, we, the challenge is we need to get to the point where we can develop that business model gotcha. to, to make it work because you can't. Do full out renovations of the building until you have that business model and you know who's running it, what it's, and how they want it to look, what you are going to need for bathrooms to go. The rooms and the sizes all depend on the age groups of the kids that are serving. So the, the I don't want to catch up, but I got to go. Yep. No, the agenda. Yep. One That's more question about this. Question. Yeah. In our agreement with Pomelo, are we allowed to take this off the market currently? Uh, the current agreement with them expired after six months, so at this okay. point. All right, yeah, that's why I just want to make sure we weren't going to get on, we're on the hook for another three months or something. No. Okay, so right now we're no representation on the building. Very clear. Okay. Great. Thank you. Next up is tax stabilization for Rocky Farm properties. Yeah, Lindsay and Keegan Hop uh, here to, to speak, and we also have Josh who's worked with, uh, with uh, Lindsay and Keegan on uh, this potential uh, request of the board. Yeah. I'm Keegan Hoft, and we're here to ask for the tax stabilization for Rock Farm Properties to put in the new rec center in town um, to keep kids busy doing things. So. Doing good things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're looking, we basically are looking to stabilize 6 Park Street where we currently have an apartment building and we're looking to put an addition of 6,000 square feet onto that property. So we're looking to stabilize that initial addition because it's going to be an indoor recreation space. We tried like heck to make it nonprofit and had zero luck. So we're running profit, but it means that we're not running on grants and those things. So we really need to keep the costs reasonable, especially for the first few years, so that Mochito, which is basically us, <laughs> um, can come in and run that space and get it going. So by stabilizing the tax, it's going to make it much easier for us to make it a reasonable rent for the space so that we can house it with all of the equipment that we need. Um, we've worked with a lot of um, people throughout the state. We've worked with Vermont Economic Development Community and Bar Harbor Bank were the ones that helped us finally um, get the building going. RACBC is going to play a huge role in helping us with our startup funds. Um, so we're needing that community support and this is one of the ways that we can kind of help to make those first few years um, more doable for us. Um, I kind of think our project basically needs like every aspect of the tax stabilization in terms of it's giving a need for the community in terms of youth, adults, um, those with health issues. We're working with Claremont and Gifford Center, uh, Gifford Medical Center, all the schools to provide um, daily and evening programs and stuff like that there. Um, it's going to provide jobs anywhere from one to like five or six depending on the size and it's going to bring people to town for reasons like Damien said, which it gives families more things to do here, which gives them reasons to come and work and live here. And when you come here, they'll hopefully use restaurants, get gas, you know, do all those other things. If they end up with a hotel someday, it gives people something to come to the town and do and hang out. So um, that's how I think it kind of meets the basic demands that the stabilization requires. Josh, is there a proposed schedule? Uh, I did not. Uh, Mm -hmm. the same as we've been using with uh, the others? No, I think we would discuss any uh, potential contract um, in the second session. But there are some okay. options, yes. Maybe you could discuss the recreational opportunities that you're going to be offering uh, in the center in some of the revenue model. Yeah, so basically we're going to be looking at a few different uses. That, well, the building's going to be set up in sort of three main sections. There's going to be like a gymnastics style setup. If anybody's ever been to um, Sunrise Gymnastics in Barrie, it's going to have like a rock wall, springboard floor, um, trampoline track onto a big jumpy airbag. Um, there will be, the other side is going to have turf space with 
batting cages that pull out and can push back in, so you can do batting cage practice as well as use the turf for just about anything you would use outside grass for. Um, so soccer, lacrosse, bocce. It's basically half a soccer field inside, so you can run drills on half a soccer field, or you can set up a volleyball court out there, or you can, you know, the golf, the, uh, excuse me, the batting cages are also golf driving range cages. Um, and then the upstairs of the space is going to have um, golf simulators in it um, as well as sort of like an adult workout space. Um, so the model kind of is built on memberships for families and individual use. So families will be able to get a yearly membership to come in and use the facility when it's open and available. Um, there'll be the come in and pay your $10 because I'm in from out of town and I want to come and climb on a rock wall for a day. Um, but then the other big piece of the model is working with the community resources like we talked about. Um, so like Claire Martin, Gifford, they have a lot of health related programs they want to run. Diabetes, um, a walk for diabetes for example is a program that a lot of like Y's around towns will run. And it's an opportunity for individuals with diabetes to come in and walk which is really important for their health in a group. And there's huge studies that show it's successful but we don't have anywhere nine months out of the year that we can offer that because of our weather conditions. So. Um, they have grant fundings because they are a nonprofit that they're going to be able to utilize to basically rent our facility space for a low cost. We're going to keep it at under $100 an hour um, for any usages. And um, same thing for other, the rec department is another huge um, person who's going to utilize. You know, we'd like to offer gymnastics and tumbling and dance, but there's not a lot of good facilities for that. And so they've been in agreement with wanting to utilize that space. Um, youth wrestling is another one that doesn't really have a great setup there in the cafeteria at the high school, which just isn't ideal for many reasons. Um, so we're going to look at creating that um, as another option as well for them. So there's a lot of the outside spaces that are going to be coming in and renting. That's part of what's hopefully going to keep some of our overhead down. Um, and it's really trying not to create any competition with anybody that's out there. Um, you know, BTC offers a lot of great rec um, opportunities. We're not going to be competing with many of those. We're going to be hopefully um, offering additional things for their students and those that use our facility will still be getting basketball and racquetball and those things that are different from what we offer. Um, I think that's kind of the main usages of birthday parties. Um, some of those, we want to do some community events like movie nights in the middle of the winter when everybody could use to come and sit on what feels like grass and, um, and hang out with family and stuff like that. So um, teen nights, um, those are things that we hope to help maybe get sponsored by local businesses. Um, where you can come. I mean, when I was a kid growing up here, we had a teen center, but it meant that you could get dropped off at Friday night from like 5 till 10 and you didn't have to see your parents and it was with a bunch of kids and we played pool and did other stuff. We're hoping to encourage movement, so it'll be rock climbing and playing golf or setting up a bunch of teenagers basically or like anything that's with a competition will do. So um, we're going to work with the movement PBLs this year um, as well as some of the other power based learning um, that are at the high school. Um, RTCC um, is having students help us build. The Brunswick School is sending students to help us build. So it's pretty much as much of a community project as you could pretty much get. Okay. So, uh, she referred to um, hitting points in the staff stabilization policy. I haven't actually seen that policy. Staff stabilization policy? Yeah. There is one that we have uh, for the town. Um, didn't put one for the board today, but there is one that the town has that um, is a guideline for every organization that wants to request for tax addition. It could be good for us to review. Sure. Is this just for the addition or for the apartment building as well? That's there. Uh, just for the addition. Well, I mean, it can't do anything. It's all one piece of property, so I think yeah. it would be looking at the entirety okay. of it yeah. because yeah. it all would be taxed yeah. the same. So it's looking at the fact that. We'll be seeing a pretty big increase in that tax once that building is is there and assessed. The, the policy is this: the stabilization only applies to the enhanced family as a project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the purpose was to present, and then you said you guys would get a chance then to touch base on it and let us know. But for us, it was kind of left yeah. the purpose. And what's the project timeline? I think you guys have started, oh, yes. correct? We have, we have dug we have. some ground, yes. <laughs> We have, um, we're still hoping to be open, you know, sometime in January. It looks more like the end of January now than the beginning, but Winter that's 20, what we're pushing for, um, you know, as long as we can get the permits to continue landing. Right. What are the additional permits that you need? We're just working with the Division of Fire and Safety on the building right now. Okay. So that's 
So we're close. The final agreement, I should say. When do you expect that? A week and a half. If we're lucky. Yeah, yeah. A week and a half ago, exactly. Yeah, it's it's been a little bit of a backpedal with them, but and a big big learning curve. Um, it's something I'd look into much ahead of time if you're going to do any sort of exchanging to any building that's going to be communities, because um, it's definitely been a little bit of a backpedal. But we're very it's close now. Taking so. yeah. notes, in you? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So that's where we want to we want to get them involved first because it definitely yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're we're hopefully within the next couple. Of but weeks everything is moving forward as we're putting the pieces in place. Everything continues to, yeah. to move forward. Concrete's so, waiting for a call. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Are they going to be here for the executive session? That they're not. Maybe? No. Josh again has been working with uh, with uh, our representatives from RCDC, um, who have also met with uh, one or two members of the select board to discuss uh, the Salisbury Square project. Uh, at this point, um, Julie um, has gone to the point where she'd like to meet share more with the board and potentially ask for for assistance from the town. Oh, I know where to reach you. Julia Flynn, I'm with RACPC. I want to introduce also Peter Schneider and Phoebe Hauber from Efficiency Vermont. They're going to help out with some of the presentation. But I thought it would be good since it's been a long time to sort of revisit what Salisbury Square is. Um, so Salisbury Square is a planned community. It was on the former site of the old, what they used to call the Ethan Allen plant number one, which before that was the Salisbury Furniture Company. It's about four and a half acres, a little under four and a half acres in, in the village at the end of Salisbury Street. And it was a vacant, abandoned, pretty much a crime scene for a lot of years. I think almost 20 years when we acquired it in 2006. And then um, there was a, thanks to Two Rivers and a bunch of EPA funding, there was an extensive period of characterizing the site and find out that it's had some brownfield issues that needed to be cleaned up work with the state and others to come up with the funds to do that. And so um, we began to design and permit the site for a planned community of mixed income, pedestrian friendly, energy efficient homes. And were permitted back in the 2009 period for a total of 36 units, 14 units of low income housing tax credit which is under 60% median income apartment housing, uh, and then 22 units of single family detached or attached home ownership units. Um, and the, the site is really one parcel, but because of the planned community, it has different sections, um, some for the uh, apartments, some for the home ownership, and then there's one historic building that we rehabbed as a part of the project. So um, the cleanup is done. Uh, this thing, the, the 14 apartments are built. The first phase of the infrastructure is built. The bookkeeping and historic property is rehabbed. And the, the permitting for that initial um, project is all uh, was secured. Uh, and we started to build around 2009, which as you may remember was sort of a tragic year for the economy and, and uh, a tragic sort of decade for the real estate market. And so the, um, the way we had planned to develop it was no longer feasible. Some of the designs over time have become less feasible. And so in about 2017, we started to re-envision the site as the market started getting better, as, as you know, loan funds and, and other funds started to flow a little better. And also as the state um, started focusing a little more on home ownership uh, incentives, uh, realizing that 
not just apartments needed incentivizing, but because of because of the fact that the cost of building was increasing faster than people's ability to increase their income, that we had a funding gap for middle income people that was actually getting as severe as the crisis for lower income people. So um, we hired um, some architects to look at a revised site plan, and that's the, the plan that you see on the back page of this handout, which is a little more pedestrian friendly, a little more, a little more elbow room. And we started to talk seriously with Efficiency Vermont and others about the concept of doing something a little different with the housing and making it net zero. And net zero essentially just means that the, the, the solar, in this case, on the house is sized to cover the cost of the energy that the house would use. And the concept is to, again, to try to get to you know, a more affordable energy, because there's a lot of energy poverty out there, people who can maybe afford to pay for their home or their mortgage or their rent, but they can't necessarily pay for the cost of heating. Um, and so these tend to be all electric homes. Some have often now backup batteries in case of power outages, um, but they're essentially no heating bill on an average year. And so um, the you may have heard of the Vermont. The Vermont was sort of the first uh, Vermont um, business that made a turnkey net zero home, and we spent a lot of time looking into their product. But since then, it has become a real trend in real estate development. And now we have at least three other uh, three building companies, regional, um, who are able to produce net zero homes. And I'll let Peter talk a little bit about that, but essentially we're trying to get a, at a price point where with a combination of funding that we can uh, try to get, make these products affordable to the average income person. The state now is targeting what they call 80 to 120% median income, meaning the, the sort of bracket around the average home or household income in our region as uh, a place where they want to invest some money to make those homes available. There's very little, I think as you know, very little new home ownership development at all because of the cost, unless it's spec for someone who has higher income, because of the cost of development. And so we're trying to now pull together the sort of phase two of this development to enable us to complete the project, add about 18 units of housing, mostly home ownership. Um, finish up the infrastructure and be able to have that be the neighborhood that it was designed to be initially. Um, and so, um, sort of as, as Damien was saying, we, we all work in this, in this world where there are chickens and there are eggs and they're all roaming around. Um, and so we, we have been doing a lot of work on the potential feasibility, what funders are out there, who could pay for what, <coughs> excuse me, what might the cost of these net zero homes be as a, as a range because different home builders have different models and different, you know, different ways of doing things. And can we get that price point to the point where with the different grant funding programs or tax credit programs and subsidies that we can make it affordable? And we think we are, uh, we are now finding that we can be in that zone but in order to do that, the big, biggest impediment is that if you go to buy a house in town, anywhere here, you don't expect to have to buy the road too. You don't have to expect to have to buy the utilities too. And so the big impediment for us is covering the cost of the infrastructure because that is still a pretty hefty price. Those prices have gone up and continue to go up substantially since we started. And while we started the infrastructure and have the first round of mains in, for the water and the sewer and the first sort of loop of the road and some of the lighting and some of the electric. To finish the project, you have to continue that loop road. You have to, um, by, by our code, is all underground required in that, um, in that development. And so the cost of that is something that we need, we know we need to cover in grant funds. Um, and so to get to the point where we're the last bracket here is what are we asking from the town? 
So obviously we'd like the support of the town because it's a big project. It's an expensive project. I think we already have about four million dollars in the ground there to do the first round of, of development. Um, there's also one house built that we built in 2012 um, that is an energy efficient but not a net zero home. So it's probably developing, I'm guessing, around $20,000 a year in tax base from that, as well as we upgraded the water system for a whole part of that neighborhood that's now benefiting from that. So it's, you know, it's, it's not a brownfield, it's not a crime scene, it's developed with homes, so it's, it's partly the way there. But to get all the way there, we're going to need the support of the town with funders, the support of the town just generally as we go to the, um, the various agencies that we need to do to get their support. And we're also going to need um, to go to BCDP, which is one of the big funding sources that funds housing and infrastructure. And um, we're going to need to get a, a slug of uh, con contributing capital for them. So one of the things we need from the town, or we're asking the town to support, is to support that grant application within the next year as we pull together some of the other funding sources, because BCDP does like to be you know, not one of the first, but one of the later funding sources. Um, the sort of um, universe of funding sources that we're looking at right now, just to name a few, is we have applied to Northern Borders, which is a relatively new funding source for our region. We are applying to VHCB, which is a housing conservation board, which is traditionally funding apartment housing, but is increasingly now opening themselves up to funding um, private home ownership for median incomes. Um, we're looking, working with Efficiency Vermont to fund some of that, uh, to help us with a variety of things, including the net zero standards, but also things like incentives for the solar and, um, and some private foundation money as well. Um, so the other things that we are hoping to get the town support on is that since this was developed, um, and I was at this, in this exact seat, I think, in uh, 2016 when the bylaws passed, um, asking that um, asking that the PUD district, the Planned Unit Development District, be reinstated into the bylaws because in the bylaw revision it was removed and in the discussion it seemed like it was not removed with prejudice, it just was removed because it was something that they didn't realize had been used, I guess, as much as it had been, but there are at least three to five um, developments in town that were permitted with a planned unit development uh, district, and now we are sort of a little bit of, uh, you know, without that supporting uh, zoning in the bylaws. Um, so uh, we're going to ask that that be, again, that that be, um, supported as reinstating the bylaws. And finally, the, um, there is a time line to the sewer and water allocation. We spent something on the order of, I think, sixty or $70,000 getting our sewer and water allocation of this project, the entire project at once, because it couldn't be pieced apart by, by phases at the time, at least. But that has an expiration date that can be extended by the town, as I understand the the regulations, and we're asking that be extended so that we don't have to come up with another 30 or 60 or whatever it is now, thousand dollars in infrastructure development allocation costs. Um, do you want to talk a few minutes about the designs? And sure, sure. I can hand out a few things, something to look at. But, um, okay. Efficiency Vermont just wants to be here. We've spent a lot of time with uh, Julie and RICBC. This is just larger, so you have a chance to look at it. And then I'll also just give just some examples of the designs. But um, we've been supporting, yeah, um, we've been supporting this type of housing. You just want to look at like, some of the floor plans and get your design options. Just to give you a sense. And supporting, um, High performance homes for a better part of the last two decades. It's always a work in progress. Um, so things have changed over the last two decades. I'd say 10 years ago, uh, we did our first sort of zero energy modular home with uh, preferred building systems that are out of Claremont, New Hampshire. And since that time, we've been replicating that model, working with various factor, uh, factories, 
uh, in New England. Uh, they don't want to deliver too far, so we typically are working with folks here in Vermont. Um, Julie mentioned Vermont, but Huntington Homes in East Montpelier. Um, preferred Building Systems has also become New England Homes as well. Uh, and then we've got a couple in New Hampshire and Maine, KBS Homes in South Ferris, Maine, as well as uh, Unity Homes, which is in Keene, New Hampshire. All perfectly capable of building, uh, and they're becoming far more common orders for them. So markets sort of driving them to provide uh, these. But uh, what we found, we've done a lot of post-occupancy research uh, going into homes. Uh, we've done a bunch of sort of market evaluations as well, and we're just finding that there's a greater demand, and the folks that are living in these homes um, are really happy. Not just with the energy efficiency, right? It's really nice that you get your electric bill and you have as much of a credit as you do uh, with regards to your usage. But also on the comfort side, uh, perceived indoor air quality, those are all much better. And then, as Julie mentioned, you know we are starting to put battery storage into homes. Green Mountain Power has a great residential battery program. You may have heard of like the Tesla Powerwall, but we can now, with these all-electric homes, install a really affordable battery into these homes. Power goes out, these homes can continue to operate uh, with their electric heating and cooling systems ventilation systems, refrigerator keeps going, lights for instance. Uh, so the resiliency there as well as we have more severe weather events both in the summer with really hot humid days, also in the winter with those polar vortexes we've seen the last couple of years. Um, this is just becoming more important, providing that safety net. So I'm just here to answer any questions, Phoebe Howe as well. Um, you know, we have, we're about to deliver under our zero energy modular program, our 100th home just in the last four years. Um, we've been monitoring most of those homes and have found, you know, we have folks who use less than they produce, so they have a credit, and they've even been allocating that to family members through what's called group net metering. Uh, and then we have folks who use more energy than they produce, but that's because they're finally in a home, for instance, that has air conditioning, or they can finally afford that freezer that they've always wanted uh, that they add to their home. Um, but overall, we're finding that these homes are really performing well, as I said, across that spectrum of energy, comfort, indoor air quality, and resilience. Um, and this, for us, is a really exciting project. We have done a couple of developments. We have 13 units uh, in a development up in Hardwick, um, another 14 in Waltham. Uh, we've done some higher market rate, zero energy communities as well. Uh, but a, one like this, downtown in the village, uh, that'll be a mix of rental and home ownership and also meeting a, a real broad uh, income spectrum in regards to the home buyers and renters is really unique. So um, we're just here to just, you know, provide uh, support to, to Julie and again answer any questions in regards to the housing and, and the support that we provide moving forward. So, thanks. Peter, what do you uh, find on resale value? Well, if you look nationally, homes that uh, are meeting energy efficiency standards are selling for more than homes that don't. So if you carry the Energy Star Home Certific Certification, for instance, or Zero Energy Ready Home, which is the Department of Energy standard, uh, your home can sell for more. 10 to 15 percent has been shown. Um, what we're finding here is we're installing homes. Um, a lot of people don't leave these homes, to be perfectly honest. We were just talking about this in a meeting that um, even younger couples that might be getting into first-time home ownership are talking about dying in these homes, you know. So um, there's just a longer term in regards, so we don't have a lot of turnover. A lot of folks have invested in these homes and haven't moved. Um, and we've really been seeing these innovative, energy-efficient, quote-unquote, green homes over the last decade about more and more. So just not many have changed hands, but what we've seen nationally in regards to that trend is um, a higher market evaluation and higher sales price than you'd see with uh, typical code construction. So if you're looking at the market group that you have for these fast forward 20, 30 years, those solar panels have to be replaced. How are they gonna afford to dispose of the first ones, which is quite pricey, mm -hmm. and buy new ones and replace them? Mm -hmm. yeah. I could just speak to that. You know, again, I think, um, and we see uh, some of this in Europe, real innovative ways in which they're recycling. Uh, even PVC windows, for example, here they, they, they end up in the landfill. Um, in a number of Western Europe countries, they're required to be recycled and they're able to recycle every bit of that. Um, with solar panels, 
Uh, just to give you an idea, um, if there's anything going into a house with a great warranty, it's the solar panels. Um, those are warrantied for 25 years with 80% production uh, based on the rated capacity of 25 years. Um, just to give you a comparison, you know, the hot water heater is typically a year in your house or the heat pump might be 10 years or 12 years at the most. Um, same with boilers. Uh, so as far as um, warranty and longevity, the solar panels are definitely up there. But it's a really good question in regards to making sure that these homes are affordable as things need to be fixed or broken. They go to the end of life. Yeah. They're not forever. The solar no, panels no. Are. So we get to the end of their useful life. Yep. And we have a couple who's in their first-time homeowners. They've acquired it from however. Yep. Stretched about making what's coming in is going out. Yes. And now all of a sudden we're at the end of the useful life of these solar panels. Yeah. How do they afford some of those additional costs? That well, I'll just speak to, so where we're going to be going, if you look at our state's comprehensive energy plan as an example, and you also look at the price of solar. So you wouldn't need to replace the racking. Uh, you'd replace the inverters that um, uh, basically manage the electricity that the solar panels are producing and the solar panels. Um, and let's say in 20 years uh, that system needs to be replaced, it'll be a fraction of the cost of the um, system today, and very likely uh, we'll see policies within the state that significantly reduce that cost further um, because we're going to need to be generating uh, renewable, you know, safe, sustainable energy. So um, that may not be the case with some things in the house, right? The roof itself uh, may have a 30 to 50 year life expectancy. That's something that probably won't be subsidized um, or will reduce in cost very much. So those are things I'd be more worried about in regards to long-term maintenance, but that's pretty common across all housing types, whether it's zero energy modular uh, or it's just a typical code home. So I think that um, what we're providing, uh, and I've seen this um, following um, a few houses now uh, for 10 years very closely, that these homes have lower maintenance. Uh, we don't have uh, fossil fuel-based appliances. They need less maintenance. Um, there's less cleaning of them. Um, and we're seeing so less maintenance on a main annual basis. You know, a fossil fuel oil-based boiler, for instance, or furnace, really should see at least one, if not two, services a year at, say, $200. Um, the heat pumps that we're installing, it might be every two years you'll have one service that's typically less expensive than that one service on a fossil fuel-based piece of equipment, just because it's less taxing the way those operate. So, I think, I think the other, one of the other things to remember is that, you know, we have the... Um, I think the dubious distinction of having the oldest housing stock in the country. And so the alternative is to buy something that's older that will not necessarily have the energy efficiency or, or not have the same level of energy efficiency and will still need the upgrades that are typical to just any obsolescence in any home. So so um, the average, I think, savings that they quote for the difference between like a net zero and an energy efficient home even is about $2,300 a year. Um, not everyone will set aside that as they maybe should thinking about reserves in the future, but there's the opportunity to do that because you have the savings on the front end that essentially the capital has bought you. And what we're trying to do is to get that capital cost down to a point where the average person, not the high end person, but the you know, more average person can get in that home and start to reap the benefits of that savings and and the you know the air quality that Peter mentioned and all those other benefits that are you know really tangible benefits. So you're thinking that when it comes time to dispose of the solar panels, more or less, that the state's going to step in and subsidize that? Who's going to? Well, we just put in a solar farm. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. one of the panels came through defective, and I will tell you, it was not cheap for them to deal with that. It had to be all packaged in special material and put into mm -hmm. crates, and yeah. a special truck came to get it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, you know, you sell this to these people that it's, oh, it's dead zero, you're going to save money, and it's all, but there's this hidden piece there that in a regular house, you know it. You know, you, my windows are going to last this long and whatnot. Yeah. But these solar panels, not everybody understands that when something goes wrong with them, it's not cheap right. to get rid of the one that's defective or has the problem and get a new one in there. To replace it. It's not, you know, a door, I can take the door out, send it to wherever and put a new door in. Yeah. I 
and that's not the case with these. Oh, I was just going to say, I, mean, I think that's a really important consideration with any new construction. Um, one of the benefits of this collaboration that we have between Efficiency Vermont, local affordable housing groups, and uh, whichever builder or builders we might work with is sort of the commitment to um, working with homeowners. So in other projects that Efficiency Vermont has been involved in, um, you know, we don't leave after the last person moves in. We're there um, assisting with service needs, helping connect people to contractors, um, working with builders to make sure that warranties are honored. So um, stepping in to really facilitate any challenges that do come up. Um, and then the other thing that I um, talk to folks a lot about, and this actually speaks to the resale question as well, um, people are you know wondering about this is the first time they've had a heat pump in their home, they're you know wondering how it's going to sell in 30 years. And I talk to folks about this type of construction as the home of 2030, 2040, 2050 today. So none of the technology that's going into these homes is brand, brand new. This is stuff that's been used in Vermont for at least the past 10 years. So we've had experience with it, um, both sort of with the efficiency Vermont as well as kind of socially. Um, thinking about when it comes time to replace that solar to get that new heat pump to sell your home, um, that is going to be sort of a mass market appliance technology, um, but also consumer demand, you know, for somebody who's coming in looking to buy a new home. So we're really sort of getting folks prepared for that home of 2050 um, today, but not in a crazy internet connected voice controlled way. It's about um, tried and true technologies that really benefit people's comfort, health, um, resiliency in their lives. Ms. Julie, what's the, what's the plan for starting, continuing, finishing? What, what is that timeline? Is it a three year, five year, 10 year type project? I think it would be a two, two to three year sale period. And we would try to do some pre-sales once we have the, the design we have now. This is one of the chicken and egg things that with some of the funding sources, until you get through a certain part of the grant application, you can't even put the RFP out to, so we know we've done enough work, thanks to help from here and Phoebe, so that we know who's out there that can deliver these, um, these homes in our region, who's interested, and we have a lot of interest from at least three of those builders, um, but we can't even put an RFP out until, and we were just talking with Adolfo recently about, and Josh about, you know, starting starting one of these processes so that we can get to the point where we can even you know do the RFP without losing the opportunity of the grant. Um, but once the designs are in place and we know what we can deliver at what price, and having got through some at least some of the funding rounds, then we'll be able to show people what we can offer and start taking free sales. Until then, um, it's going to be hard. We're also looking at. Uh, a funder who may help us with a, a model home so that we can actually show people. We have the little Vermont, which is like a tiny version on a cart, um, but that we want to be able to have, a, you know, an actual design home that people can go in and look and see what they can buy on site. And, and what does it mean to put 18 new houses on the market and run up I mean, with this income is that? We're Are anticipating. I mean, yeah, we're just, we're actually in the process of having more market updated market studies done now. But um, a few things for those units right now, we're targeting at the net the next highest level of rental. So it'd be the 60 to 80 percent median income. The people who maybe aren't quite ready to go into homes, but are making too much to go into the low income housing apartments that are there already. So a few of those would be that middle range sort of on their way to home ownership and then the rest, so we're talking about, you know, something like you know, 12 to 14 um, of these homes. And that's, you know, I think between now and 2023, I think that they're projecting 30 homes on the market, it, depending on which study you use, and we're having a market study done now. Um, but clearly, um, the advisor that we were working with now is saying that people are looking for new. They're not finding any, um, especially people who are trending downtown, which is younger and older buyers, and there's just not a lot out there. So um, we think that this is the product that is really missing at a price point for just, just unattainable for this kind of product. And that's what we're hoping, that's the gap that we're hoping to fill. Again, with the help of these programs that also recognize that this is something that you can't just do the 
normal way, you know, if you will, the market way, because the market's just not supporting it. I'll just also just speak to, Evie and I spend a lot of time in our model homes around the state and communities. Um, I just was in Middlebury in our model home for about five weeks, and we posted some of these designs um, with the Salisbury Square site plan, just to get folks sort of, it was up on the wall, just sort of um, see what people said. And a lot of people were just asking, where is this? This is, I would move there if I could live in a community like this with this type of home, because it really doesn't exist. So um, I do think that, and we've seen this with other homes. We've had some model homes that we've put out there as spec homes, and we've drawn folks from other communities just to that home because they can't find that type of home somewhere else, and they don't want to build one. They just like to have that home that's offered on the market. Um, so I do think that there's going to be an element uh, where we draw in. I, I spend a good deal of time in Bristol, Vermont. There's a new community there very similar to this. Um, it has a co-housing element, but it has community green space, community gardens. There's a community building, just like the bookkeeping house that's at Salisbury Square right now. Um, that filled up very quickly, has a very similar feel, um, and you know, no empty units there with a waiting list of folks who are looking to get I mean, did we come to a, I wasn't clear if we came to a conclusion on it. I think the consensus is we're not going to renew our real estate agreement <laughs> currently. I'm just getting that sense. Yeah. Okay. And I think that we're kind of sending you off to maybe put a little bit more together so that we can chat about it and then become a little more concrete about what you need. I think we're, that's where we're at. So the, so the commitment I have right now is not to renew the real estate commitment. Well, that's, we have to. I, I just want to make sure there's something concrete that yeah, I, no, I think there's support some, and then there was some back and forth. I think you've got to support yeah. for it, is my understanding. So I think that we're behind the project. We just need a little bit more detail to figure out how. I just wanted to make sure I didn't need a, a motion to make sure that was well, clear or anything else. You're okay. I think you can move along. <laughs> I think you can keep moving forward. Yes, the, the, it should be in your packets. Yeah. Uh, no, the proposal is for Arts and Culture Committee. It's at the very back because we've relocated it to item D. It's a one pager and it has our culture. Mine's stuck behind it's the window. Yeah, that's right. Don't need mine? No. It's an action item. Yeah, I understand it. Yeah. Um, we, town staff, have been, uh, we had a meeting with uh, Susanna Colby, who's here representing the community group that's interested in creating the uh, Arts and Culture Committee. Um, the meeting included uh, Susanna, it included uh, Sonny Holt. Uh, who's a local resident and our chair for the planning commission, as well as Tom Ayers, formerly from Chandler. Um, and Susanna is here to talk a little bit more about the committee's interest in their proposed work. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. So um, we wanted to put together a committee to look at how we could represent the arts um, in the town of Randolph and help connect the different art centers, um, make this like a hub for um, the arts and culture in the area. There's a lot of artists in this area. I've been putting together some um, uh, through the art task force, um, some gatherings, and there's just a really big interest in, in getting some things going in this town um, and collaborating with um, uh, different partnerships in the town to bring the arts um, to the front um, through sculpture gardens, through murals, through different projects. And we just haven't been able to do that um, on our own. So we're looking to put this together, um, this committee together, to make it a, a stronger, um, form a stronger um, committee <laughs> to uh, make these things happen. Because right now, um, trying to do it on my own has been um, a lot of work and, and really hard to do. And if I could add to what Suzanne is, um, one of the, the point of confusion that I had when, when sharing this with the board is that the, the, the group went away and actually pulled together a proposal to share with the board that included prospective members, a mission statement that uh, was much more concrete than this action item sheet that I pulled together to share with you. So um, my apologies for not presenting that to you, but it was 
uh, very detailed proposal that included potential members uh, uh, in the community. Yeah, that was part and of the email that we got. Did mm -hmm. you get it? Yeah. Okay. Just so I just yeah. got back mm -hmm. yesterday yeah, no, from that. traveling. That so. Great. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. The poor thing. So we had, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I'm a little jet lagged, um, but we have 12 potential members um, from the community and, you know, spreading throughout all the different arts. There's sculptors, muralists, writers, um, and, uh, and we want to put together a five-year plan to come up with how we can, you know, potentially beautify our community um, and make it a location where people want to come because of what we offer. So is this an interaction with Chandler, or is it just, what is that relationship? Is there, is there a relationship there, or is it something separate? It, it would be pulling in Chandler, it would be pulling in the craft center, it would be pulling in all oh, the different, and all that stuff, trying, to, okay. trying to get everybody to work together. Okay. Um, because right now, you know, you have independent places kind of doing their own things, and I think it would be a lot stronger if we had somebody to help pull them all together so we could make this just a unified, Arts community. The lady that does the gardening in Forest Park, Yeah. She's awesome. It's starting to creep down Forest Street. Now. <laughs> She's like, should be at the high school. It's awesome. I saw it the one day and just thanked her for doing it because it looks great. Yeah. 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 So, okay. so um, you want this to be a formal committee under the select board where we appoint people? Yes. On it? I was um, hoping I'd have. So Tom and most of the committee, well, we go with odd numbers for mm -hmm. obvious reasons for voting purposes, so you don't have a tie. And they're usually between five and nine on there, but I don't know that it can't be more, right? It just, if you get too big a crowd, it gets a little harder. It gets a little out of lowly. Sure. Um, and we, because we've been kind of apart, um, we've been traveling, we haven't talked to all of the members, they were just potential members. Um, with Sunny, Tom, and myself as being definite. <coughs> um, but then we had to figure out who the rest of the members were. So when the East Randolph one that we just created, they had like 12 or 13 that came all the time. And we just had to narrow it down and said, you know, we're not saying you can't be there. It's just come on in, share, be part of it. But this is your core sure. group. And I think what we're looking at is trying to make it as diverse as possible, too, because right, there's so a lot of different kinds of art. Right. Um, you know, with Tom, you know, being in the executive position, myself being a painter, um, Sunny being a writer, you know, to try to make sure that we represent all the different arts. Um, so and we're thinking about all of them. You know, yeah, you know there's, there's the music component, there's mm -hmm. the sculpture component, yeah. there's the painting component. So this is Graphic design. Seems like a great idea. I, I, I think, think it's a great idea. idea. Yeah, I think just it's doing the, the logistics part of it do so we don't but we don't have the members right we have the pot the potential yeah. Yeah. if, if so the board would like we could appoint the, the initial three members which would be you know tom Susanna, and sunny and then potentially leave um, four positions open to then be appointed later on as a committee as a term you know, so a, a, term a term of you know two or three years or something mm -hmm. here alternate them alternate yeah. them out we probably should advertise too, so that there are other people in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we. I'm not against any of these people, but. Oh no, know. and we we had some more that we came up with after. Um, you know, there's so many people in the community, so yeah, it would definitely be a great idea just to see who who wants to do this, um, and and who's out there that's willing to do it. Well, they can come and join too. They don't have to be on yeah, the they don't have committee. committee. The best part yeah. about that is you don't get any work. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> no, I, I, I saw this in the R three meetings that you know there was a strong sense that you know the arts community needed to be represented, and you know I, I kind of thought that after the meetings, you know that group was just it was decided that that group was going to go form their own little thing and you know start to gel up and start to see more. But you know I'm not really sure that happened. But I think this. Is a way to get that to happen. Yeah, and I'm I'm I got put as the chair of that that um, task force, and um, I have pulled together what we've called the artist shindig, mm -hmm. um, which we had almost like 30 people come from the community um, as a potluck and just a way to communicate with each other what we wanted for our community for the arts. Um, so you know they're they're out there. It's just I you know I work. You do know you'll have to go to Adolfo's meetings, yeah. you know, quarterly to yeah. share information with other 
people in the community the too. Chair right? of a committee. That's <laughs> committee <laughs> chairs meeting. I'm getting used to it now. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. No, we get them. I'm yeah. here. So I would just like to say, given given the importance for having a diversity of different people on this committee, I wonder if it makes sense to err on the side of it being <clears throat> too big rather than too small. Um, and because even though it's and anybody can come to these meetings, and being a member doesn't really give you a whole lot of extra weight, like, you know, because a lot of times these committees don't really vote very often anyway. Um, it does seem to be the case, though, that people who aren't official members tend not to show up. Yeah. So right. if you can make more people official members um, and make the committee bigger, I'd say that to maybe try and so make it a nine member. I'm thinking nine. If I can give you a nine member committee, and we get a point three of you. And then when you come back with the rest of the names, if you want more than nine, okay, we can increase the size at that point. All right, great, yeah. Yeah, that'll give us some time to look over, you know, really kind of sit down and look over who's available. Engage the real interest. Great, yes. Sure. That sounds yeah. great. Okay. Um, so we have three, do we put them all on just for a multi-year term? Knowing that we got more coming, that we can fill in the one and two. Um, do we? I mean, does it even set up that them? way? Can it just be people? Can you? <coughs> you can do it so you just appoint every year, reappoint every year. That could be the rec committee and some of that too. I mean, I mean, I think you do. You know, if you pick nine, you could do three-year terms. You could stagger them so you've got, you know. I'm just wondering if we really need to set up set up terms. The rec committee doesn't have terms. It seems to work. This is more flexible. They just stay on until they run and resign. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm fine with that enough. too. Which is, which is, which is, yeah, which is, which is what's going to happen yeah. anyway. Well, that's right? fine. Someone wants to resign. Yeah, resign I've got resign. two more years. I'm like, oh, I can't resign. <laughs> it's easier than trying to figure out whose term. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So they could just be <clears throat> appointed, then somebody decides to be off or moved, and then you just reappoint somebody. Yeah, I'm fine with that too. It's right? simple. Yeah, it keeps it easier. To make a motion. Um, it's all you. you <laughs> sure. Um, I'll move that we create a, an arts and how, an arts committee? Arts and culture. Arts and culture committee, initially composed of nine members, with three members forming the initial group, who are going to be Sunny, 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 Tom, Sunny and, Tom, and Tom, and myself, Susanna. Wait, wait. Can you make, can you state their last names? Sunny Holt, Sunny Holt, Tom Ayers, and Suzanne Colby. Tom finished the retired one enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said Colby. Colby, yeah. So I'll second that. With a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? You're on your way. Thank you. No, no, fine. Fine. Don't forget to come to the chair meeting. <laughs> we need to collaborate with the rest of these people so we can get art in the forest and wreck um, committee and yeah. I've got some great it. ideas. Oh, well, good. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have an assembly permit application for the New World Festival. Okay. Any Any questions, comments, concerns on this one? Format has not changed. The same format. We have shared the proposal with uh, all the necessary groups, uh, police department, fire. Um, we have had a response from public safety. Their response is just a, a confirmation that they would like a deputy at the festival just to make sure that everyone's covered. Um, the signature of our signature page is not included on here, but we're still working on collecting all the signatures. Same setup as last year. Same setup, yeah, important. Do we have any street closure? Main street, right? Except for we don't have it on here. Usually they close and the traffic goes around the Prince Street. Around Prince Street all the way across. Right. But it doesn't show them closing the road. Maybe be sure that's on there. But they don't talk about it closing. No. I imagine you want that many people in that area with a road. You can't have the traffic control. How will the children paint? Uh, they kind of allude to it with the traffic control for Prince and Main and Pleasant and Main now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Public safety information. Yeah. 
the plan would be to close that section of Main Street. Even if they are choosing a different format, I feel that it would be important to close it. Tim's, Tim's here to, to answer any questions if the board needs questions answered. Um, this is a, a draft lease agreement. It, it, is, it has not been uh, commented on by the Randolph Center Area Fire Association. Um, it has recently been shared with uh, our representative from Vermont League of Cities and Towns just to make sure that, um, with the understanding that it is a draft, that they would be okay with this being the uh, agreement that they have in mind. Um, Tim is here if um, you'd like to provide comments or just authorize us to go with this lease agreement, that, that could be possible. But otherwise, the intent of, of this being in your package is just to show that progress is being made on the insurance issue and that conversations continue between the town and the, the Randolph Center Area Fire Association. Properties that um, there are several properties in town that uh, have been reported on on a regular basis, but there are two in particular that continue to be brought up. Um, one is on Hebert Hill, uh, I believe the address is 390 Hebert Hill, and the other is on Dudley Street. Um, I did not include photographs of either of the properties um, in your packets, but both have. Um, Visible violations of the solid waste or the junkyard and solid waste ordinance, in town, which includes construction debris, it includes tires, uh, it includes appliances. Um, so, unregistered cars, right? All exactly. Kinds of good stuff. Yeah. So this letter is is would essentially be the second step. I'm still working with our um, enforcement officer, Milo Cutler, to determine exactly what steps have been taken in the past to notify the residents of these violations. Uh, we've, we have found that our record keeping uh, and or connections to these properties have been made very unofficially through telephone calls, text messages, uh, and or on-site visits with not an official letter being sent to the property owners. So um, although the letter in front of you is very strongly worded and it would lead to potential fines, this would be the next step. The first step for these two properties would be acknowledging that the issue has existed for several years, acknowledging that our staff have attempted to work with these two property owners to clean the property, set the record, and if attention isn't paid to the issue within a designated amount of time, the time frame I have in mind is 30 days, maybe 45, uh, for these two properties um, would then lead to this potential second letter, which is more of a targeted immediate response, correct the issue, or uh, it's not intended to be a way to raise revenue for the town. It's intended, to, the intent is to clean the properties. Mm -hmm. If the property owner comes to us and says, or shows an actual intent to clean, provides us with reasons why they can't do it right away, <coughs> establishes a plan for cleanup, uh, we'd be more than willing to work with them and bring it to the board. We have the conversation and move forward from there. But there are for the most part, these two properties, for my short period with the time, uh, my short period with the town, they haven't shown any willingness to, to actually correct the violations. So these fees, the first offense is measured in 30 days? Uh, these, yeah, with this, with this letter, 
the fees would be applied on a daily basis until the issue. So the one that would, because we have, we don't have the record, the official record of writing letters, the two properties that I mentioned. So it's fifty dollars a day. Marty's got the letters. Yeah, Mark. Oh, she, okay. Yeah, this goes on the back. Hill one. Yeah, this goes back. Some of them go back eight, nine years. Yeah, where letters hearings, were initially. Kind of stuff on yeah. um, but anyway, I, I still don't understand the fee. It's fifty dollars. First offense is. First offense would be fifty dollars fee per day until the issue is resolved. Second offense, if, if let's say for example they okay, fix. Okay, I'm not sure that maybe I miss evidence that is clear on here per day. Uh, the statement, the last sentence in the paragraph above. Daily financial benefit. A daily thing. Okay. Yeah, daily. So if they were, to, if they had an issue and then they they cured it, which is what the policy calls cleaning it up. They cured it, and then they continued to have the problem again, and then we notified them again a second time of the issue. Then they would fall under the second offense, and then it would be a hundred dollars per day until the issue is resolved. And then if they resolve the issue, it's completely gone, and then they start the issue again. Then it would fall under the third offense, one hundred fifty dollars per day. Then we should be involved. So would Judge Lloyd fall under the second one? Well, um, we did take them to court. We have uh, ranks in a large file on that. The issue is that with Dudley, that the issue was brought up before the bylaw, the, the, the solid waste and junk road ordinance was created. So there is a gray area of whether it is their first offense under the bylaw. Or under the, the the ordinance, we could potentially say, well, no, you, it was a long-running issue, so it's grandfathered in. This is actually the fourth or fifth attempt at the time to clean it up. They could potentially come back and say, well, no, this is the first offense under the solid waste and junk yard ordinance, so it's only fifty dollars a day versus one hundred fifty dollars a day. So, <clears throat> I guess my concern is if if I have if I get a letter, right, and I said, okay, I'm going to take care of this, I call up. To sell it to get a dumpster, like all right, we'll get you one in four days a week, whatever. Or it's a Monday now; the dump's not open till Thursday or Friday, whatever day it is. Yeah. You know, we're we're finding them daily at that point. Oh uh, well, the letter would give them; it would be thirty days as of the postmark on the letter. So then they would have thirty days. The letter doesn't go out until after you've already tried to reach them. Right. right? Exactly. There's already been some levels of discussion. This is when you finally just okay. can't get any response. Yeah. Okay. The letter. This is just to force the yeah. issue. The initial letter so the initial letter would notify them of this fee if they don't comply? Would notify them of that they have a violation. It wouldn't, wouldn't initially start off with the with the the schedule for fees. It would say, we've discovered an issue, it's been a long-running issue, you have a certain amount of time to contact the town on how you're going to clean it up in the time frame, and if they don't, then come to us and say, this is how I'm going to clean it up, this is, I need three months, I need four months. If they don't, approach the town to set up a cleanup plan, or if they do and say, we're not going to clean it up, then we could send a second letter saying, you approached us on this day, you said you wouldn't clean it, this is the violation schedule on the daily charge that you would get if you don't clean it up. So every attempt would be made to get them to clean it before the violation, before we start finding them. Uh, and if they choose not to clean it up, or if they choose not to contact us to create a plan, then we would start finding them on the daily. And how do you collect on the fine? I mean, does it just go indefinitely, or how does that work? Uh, that, is, that is something that I'm going to work with our state legislators to correct it. My next step is I don't want to run into this daily cycle of we're just accumulating fines. If they never pay, they never pay. I'm hoping to have some help from our state legislators that would potentially add this fee to the utility non-payment fee or the tax non-payment fee where this could lead to a potential property tax sale. Um, so this way there's an incentive. I mean, that's not something that our state legislators have committed to doing, but it's something that I intend to ask them for help on being able to clear these properties up. So you need the legislature to act mm -hmm. to make the There's no so enforcement, really. There's nothing there. You're the enforcement officer. Uh, so those are enforcement so, officers. So there's, so there's, so there's yeah. So somebody could simply say, I'm not going to pay it. And that's it. There's no recourse. We could take it to court. court. We can go to court. Yeah. At the Having moment, the ability to do a tax sale or yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, no. I'm, gets I'm, us out of the whole court <coughs> process. Right, right, but right. Our way I'm, of collecting it is only through court, which is what we've done on Dudley Street. Yeah. That doesn't help very much. Yeah, no, it didn't. Man. Well, look where Brookfield is with the one they've got on Route 14. They've won in court how many times, and it's just so costly for them to 
go in and take the property that they don't want to. But and you can get into those cases, and you can sink a lot of money into them when they're through the courts. But and then you have to then you become responsible for the environmental issues that are already on that property. So now sure, you have to push sure. yourself a bigger deal. Um, I would just I'm just wondering whether this schedule of offenses is is much more complicated than we need it to be. Um, it should just be if you don't do it within the period of time, it's a fee for per day, and that's the fee. And then you don't have to then there's no record you don't have to like consult the record, how many exact offenses has this been, you don't have to worry about going back through the files, a lot less work. It's just if the letter takes effect, it's hundred dollars a day or twenty dollars a day. Sure. Some number that makes that somewhere in here and it's just very much simpler. Sure. I could certainly, you know, whittle this down. This wouldn't be the primary contact. We the course that we decided to take was to take a step back from this until we can establish the actual record that we mm -hmm. we've had over yeah, the yeah, years. And this is definitely a draft we could certainly whittle this down to much more simple, you know, clean it or yeah. Yeah, that's that's my only suggestion. I don't think it looks good. Um, so uh, this this portion was just just to share with the board that this is something that staff is really focused on. Um, and it is, it's been brought up on several occasions that it is a quality of life issue. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. For the neighbors. For the neighbors, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But every attempt is going to be made to work with the owners mm -hmm. and try to get them to clean oh, it yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. This is just you know when when it comes like nothing's working and we need yeah. to really push the issue. Yeah. Good idea. Trans standards for roads and bridges. Uh, this will require a motion from the board if it chooses to to move forward with this. What what has happened is every I believe it's every five years, uh, Vtrans has to update its standards and ask municipalities to update their standards so we're all in compliance with Vtran road and bridge standards. Uh, what has happened recently is that. Um, not sure if the, uh, why VTrans is, is you know, not sure why FEMA is an approach to VTrans to do this, but I do know that VTrans is cutting its initial timetable short and asking towns to approve this new version of the town road and bridge standards. And the reason why they're asking the towns to do that is because FEMA has approached VTrans and has told VTrans, we understand that you have a bridge and road standards. We also understand that you have what's called the municipal roads, um, I forget the term, uh, municipal roads grant uh, general permit. Uh, but FEMA has told VTrans that they only want to recognize one document, which is the bridge and road standards. So VTrans solution to this is to combine both the old standards and the municipal roads general permit and create one document which then um, it's all inclusive and it's everything that FEMA wants to see when they come into a a natural disaster incident that occurred and they recognize that Vermont is in lockstep with what FEMA wants when they show up to help put some of these communities back together. Um, the new standards again is, is uh, it's marrying both the 2013 version of the roads and bridges standards with the existing municipal roads general permit which the town is in compliance and it adopted the 2013 standards. It's in compliance with the municipal road general permit. We, we paid for our uh, licensing for it and we're in full compliance. Um, and if the board would like, I could go through every one of these sections and say where it is in the municipal road general permit um, or to tell the board that this is consistent with the 2013 standards. But everything in here is from either the 2013 standards or the municipal roads general permit of which the town is is in compliance. If we do it now, it applies to the state law. If we do it, well, it, the current standards are in effect until August 1st. Those will expire until August 1st. And if the board takes no action on this, as of August 1st going forward, we will not be in compliance because we don't have the new standards adopted. But if the board adopts them now, uh, we will be in compliance going forward as of August 1st. As of right now, we're in compliance because everything's recognized through the dual standards. We get the extra five percent. They get the extra five percent from the state in the future. In the future, in the future. In the future.
Uh, for the April uh, storms from April 15th, we're in compliance, so we are eligible for it. Right. So if the board were so inclined, uh, we would just need a motion to approve the, the new standards, bridge and road standards, as issued by the trans and I could then authorize me to sign, and then I could sign it. Select board does sign. Select board, right. I'll move we approve the 2019 <coughs> down the road and bridge standards. Second. We should have a signature page of this in there in the folder. So I think there is. It's over Road Project Bid. Amen. We had one bidder. We had one bidder. And uh, the <laughs> one bidder. It's the supplier of everybody's pavement. Yeah. One better feels that it was the quick turnaround that the town required um, that led to them being the only better. Uh, but we've had work done by them in the past. Uh, Furnace Pike. Street, Pike Industries. Right? Furnace Street was performed by Pike and they came in uh, just slightly above budget, but that was something they explained to us well before we actually had gone through the process. And it was only above budget by $800. So we're very confident that Pike Industries, when they submit a bid, they they're full on, on target. And they can do it in four days. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of disruption for what they got to do. Not a lot of disruption. So be done before school. Be done before school. Yeah. Okay. Um, we feel very confident in their work. So that just goes from the intersection of 66 right in the green mm -hmm. rate. It goes all the way across. All the way across the entire the stretch of the intersection. Of and that is for a... Includes uh, the Y there. Includes the Y, and it would cover $100,000 of it is being covered through a Class 2 road grant that the select board has already accepted. Okay. Motion to approve the bid. Second. 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 Nothing in grants. Old business tax stabilization, tax stabilization for GMEDC. Yes, uh, I have draft copies of um, the tax stabilization agreement. Uh, the change in this document to what had been previously shared with the board is the board's request to change or to, to tie the town standards to uh, the grant standards that um, the GMEDC has to abide by and LED has to abide by. And that would be found in section six under material changes. Uh, our town attorney reviewed this material, provided comment, worked with Josh directly on this particular uh, agreement. It has been reviewed and approved by GMEDC. Uh, it is um, it's about as tight as I think we'd be able to get it with all parties agreeing to it. Tax time table remains the same. Uh, the first five years of zero tax with an incremental increase beginning on year six. Need a motion from the board to approve the tax stabilization agreement, yeah. and I believe signatures are select, select what signatures are required. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Other business. No other business. I'll keep it brief. Um, you were a really small man. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the town swimming pool is now open. Um, we had videos, I believe, um, and pictures posted online. The kids, kids running in. Pool, yeah. One kid jumped the gun, and he was a small kid. He ran in, and then was completely overtaken by all the others. So it was 
Interesting to see. <laughs> One of the last ones to run in was my granddaughter. Oh, was she really? Oh, like, I thought Aubrey was. Oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're very happy that the pool is finally open and things are uh, working out. Um, awesome. There is a plan to keep the pool open beyond the uh, school uh, starting up again, so this way we can enjoy as much of the heat in the pool as possible. Um, the plan will be most likely weekends and then also post school hours. That, depending on what our life first can actually do, but the idea is to keep it open as long as possible. Yep. Yeah. Um, and to paint it in the off-season. Yeah, absolutely. There's some issues that you know, still exist that are unrelated to the, the piping leaks, but mm -hmm. uh, there's still some time to, to work on the pool in general. It's some, some, some fairly costly yeah. maintenance. So. There's still some maintenance, absolutely. Uh, we have announced the position that's open for zoning administrator and housing, uh, I'm sorry, not housing, health officer. Um, we then discovered that a different town also took our entire job uh, title, so I think we're on the right track when we're being copied. Plagiarism? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah well, uh, tribute. We want to do the work here. too. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> So we're uh, look, we have not received any announcements yet, but we are you know confident that we're we'll, we'll solve the issue very soon. Um, there is still the issue of the regional plan that's being updated by Two Rivers Artequichi, our regional planning commission. Uh, we've submitted comments to the Two Rivers uh, staff. Uh, they have informed us that some of the comments that I had submitted to them have been accepted. They have also said that some of the comments they're not going to accept. They didn't provide me with which or confirmation of which have accepted, which have not been accepted. Uh, there was a hearing scheduled or hearing held this week and uh, actually one held tonight, which we couldn't attend tonight, but uh, I have received confirmation from Two River staff that comments will be collected up until the uh, August, I believe it's August 4th deadline. So um, it's still continuing to work with them just to make sure that the town of Randolph's needs are represented in the regional plans. Plan regional plan in general. Uh, we've had six months now under the new contract with the sheriff. Um, so I'm hoping to have a conversation with Sheriff Pontiac very soon to have him come in and share an update with the select board on some of the prime stats uh, that exist for the town. Uh, with every billing invoice that the town receives on a monthly basis, uh, we receive statistics from the sheriff's department, uh, contacts with the public, where they're going, why they're going there. So it's, it's a big change to what we had before versus what we have now. Now we have more targeted information. I see they've uh, decaled the trucks too. Yes, we finalized the sale of all the equipment, so we now are free of all police equipment, um, uh, which is great. Um, so good, good check that we received. So I'll ask the sheriff to come in or uh, one of his representatives to come in potentially for the next select board meeting to brief them more. Um, we had a productive meeting, um, Josh and I, with the R3 Chairs Committee to discuss the uh, Boston Federal Reserve's Working Communities Challenge. Um, we are hoping to have a coalition come together so that we could apply to be members of this Working Community Challenge. It includes, uh, I believe it includes money to help plan, help coordinate, to essentially essentially mimic, for the most part, the R3 process, only now it includes a considerable amount of funding so that we can move even, even more towards our goal. Um, we plan to, again, make this a coalition because the, the application process really looks for communities of 6,000 people or more. We do feel that many of our local towns will help us exceed that population amount. So uh, we're looking forward to having an application submitted once the RFP is sent out and we can apply and pull that together. RFPs scheduled to be on the fall. Yeah, probably November, <coughs> late November, early December. Okay. And before it's released, we can bring it to the board for review. What does it go for? Uh, it, 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 the working community group essentially helps us to come together with different committees so that we could establish more long term range goals for economic development or, um, I think, uh, any pretty much any goal that we have that we'd like to pull together. And once we have these goals put into place, we will then be partnered with representatives from federal agencies or nonprofit groups that will come in and uh, essentially consult for us and, and help us through the process. And it's not just these representatives that will come in and guide our specific groups. 
to fulfill their goals, but it also comes with funding so that we could potentially um, pay a consultant to do additional work or um, pay for a, a different planning portion. It's, that would be one of the key differences between R3 and the Working Communities Challenges, the dedicated funding. Money, right? Money. Comes with money. Yeah. So we're, we're confident uh, that we could pull something together for, for that application process. Um, we have had no significant movement with the uh, ongoing conversation with Northfield Ambulance Service. The last meeting I had with them was very productive. Uh, they felt that they could pull together a plan that could be presented to the select board in the future, and the plan would um, discuss potential costs for ambulance service through Northfield, potential location for the ambulance where they feel um, would be more beneficial. Uh, preliminary comments say that they would, that they feel very strongly about potentially being in Randolph Center. Um, they could potentially partner with Vermont Technical College or VTC with their EMT program. Um, they also have what could be a potential bay in Vermont Technical College's former fire service, fire, fire science academy, which is um, no longer going to be at the Randolph campus. So there are options. Um, they also explained to me why, even though they differ from Werba in that Northfield Ambulance does not have paramedic service, they also explained to me that paramedic service is mostly necessary when you have vast territory to cover. Um, which is exactly the model that Orva operates in, and then it has a very large territory. It takes them much longer to get to certain parts of their territory. And in our case, it, it, take, it took upwards of 40 minutes uh, to reach their base over to East Randolph, which is why uh, paramedic would be necessary, but if we have an ambulance base in Randolph Center that could reach either part of our town in a fraction of the time, we would not need paramedic service. So. But that's part of an ongoing conversation. Just be picking somebody up and just running them to the hospital. Exactly. You just need a level of care to stabilize somebody and not beyond that. Exactly. Interesting. So one of the questions I'm, uh, I don't know, but back, back when I knew about it, you were mostly staffed by Norwich students. Um, is that still the case? Do they have issues with staffing during the summer months when the students are gone? They haven't shared any staffing concerns with, with me. They feel that they would be confident enough to staff the ambulance uh, on a regular basis. Um, they would have to hire more personnel, uh, but they felt that they could meet our needs, and it would be 24-hour coverage. That, of course, felt part of preliminary conversations as opposed to everything on paper, and they're still looking at numbers on their end to, to give us a potential price point for the service that we would like versus the service that they can provide. Yeah. I think that'd be good too when we get to that point is to have like a, you know, when you go buy insurance, get a side-by-side -side comparison of the policies. Yep. Right? What service are we getting? What is the expectation? Absolutely. You know, compared to the cost. Yeah. Because I hate buying insurance is cheaper for you. Yeah. Three times up. <laughs> uh, I'll share more information when it becomes available. <laughs> Uh, and the, the last point I'd like to just uh, share with the board is that we've had ongoing conversations with several community groups. Um, they include Chandler, it include, includes RACDC, and it includes Randolph Center Area Fire Association. Uh, the conversations, ongoing meetings, and interactions uh, vary where they are. For the most part, they're all moving in a direction of being able to solve uh, whatever perceived issues there, there may be. Uh, there could still be some issues that we have to iron out in the long, the long run, but for the most part, we remain engaged with these groups. We remain um, actively speaking with them and at the very least addressing the issues that have existed in the past and working toward potentially solving them in the future. Uh, in the case of Chandler, I felt that the last meeting was very productive. They have agreed to change some of the pricing models for some of their seats. They've agreed to have more children programming, more family programming to bring in more people. They're willing to work with, with the town to potentially incorporate some of our town events and potentially end over at Chandler so we could make, it, make them seem less of, a, of an outlier and more of an uh, inclusive group. Um, they seem very receptive. They have younger members of their board that are also working with us on, on these issues. So we feel very confident that, that change is coming, positive change. Uh, and that's it that I have for the manager's report. Right.
entertain a motion to go into executive session, <clears throat> but we have two issues, the draft settlement agreement and then the tax stabilization agreement for the tax stabilization agreement. We should have Adolfo and Josh so we can in and do that one first and then move Josh to the curb and finish. Because he'd like to get out of here, I'm sure. Sure, I'll make the motion to go into executive session and then keep the dope and Josh for that purpose. Second. All those in favor? 